Okay, let's backtrack a little bit. Um, hi, everyone. We're going to wait until 7.05, just because the meeting ended and some people might have been kicked out. Um, if you've been here for like a really long time and the other classes, feel free to like go get a snack or drink water, go to the bathroom. I'm going to start like exactly at 7.05. Can you hear me now? Okay. Can I have a third person tell me if they can hear me or not? Uh, okay. I'm going to assume most people can hear me. All right, cool. Um, yes, so 7.05, we'll start because the meeting ended. Um, feel free to get water something. And I will start sharing my screen. This is not world geography. This is um, biology. <laughs> um, Alexandra, world geo, I think, was a bit earlier. Okay, it's 7.05. Um, yeah, World Geo was at five. Let's get started on biology. So biology is interesting. It's very fun. I think it is the most interesting field of science. And um, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, there's a lot of applied chemistry in this. So when you're learning about biology, you will have to learn about macromolecules, which is like the most biology leaning slash chemistry topic. And there are also a lot of times where you'll have to learn about bonds and elements. Um, I won't be going over that here or today, but if you guys want that, I can recap and go over that next week. So we're gonna go straight into macromolecules. And macromolecules are essentially like the four main basic things that make up our body or any biological molecule starting with carbohydrates. Um, carb carbs are also sugars. Um, if you've ever like eaten a piece of bread or maybe like a cracker, try dissolving it in your mouth and just keep it in there for a little bit. And you might realize it's starting to taste a little sweet. And that is because um, sugars are carbs. You might know that, uh, you can see in this image, bread is it's starchy, pasta. Um, those are all carbohydrates. And the basic of a carbohydrate um, every single macromolecule has a monomer and a polymer of it. So in this case, carbs are, the monomer is a monosaccharide, so that's like the basic unit, and a polysaccharide is a bunch of monosaccharides strung together. Um, you'll see this a lot. If you haven't taken pre-AP biology, this is one of the first things you'll learn, and you are tested over it. I'm not sure about AP bio, but it's always good to know monosaccharides, disaccharides, polysaccharides. Mono meaning one, di meaning two, poly meaning many. And carbs are hydrophilic. Hydrophilic is essentially something that is soluble in water. There are things that are hydrophobic, such as fats. And you might notice if you've ever tried to mix oil and water, it doesn't work because oil is hydrophobic. Phobia is like when you're scared of something. So I would say I have arachnophobia, right? I have a fear of spiders. In the same way, you could think of fats or oils as being scared of water, which is why they don't mix. 
and in this case, carbohydrates do mix. Um, also, it's good to note the form of carbs. If you know the glucose, glucose's molecular formula, it's C6H12O6. And you can see on like the little bottom left, it says CNH2NON, in this case, N equals six. Um, and then these are just different ways that carbs are structured. You don't need to know this like too much, but it, it's interesting to see like how the structure affects the function. So there are two main groupings. when you look at carbs and sugars, you can see on the left side, there are aldehyde groups and ketone groups. Aldehyde groups are, um, you can see there's a double bond. So a double bond is two lines between two elements. In this case, you see on the left column, there's a double bond between the carbon and oxygen at the end. It's kind of like a tail, right? And that is what we mean by aldehydes. And then by ketone, you can see that the double bond between carbon and oxygen is kind of like in the middle of the carb. It's not on the ends. And um, that is just the difference between those two. And then you may know of ribose, ribose sugar, it's used in RNA and deoxyribose is used in DNA. And those are some of the basic um, molecules in our body, which we'll go over a little later. And then, so, I say there are polysaccharides and monosaccharides, but we should also know like, how do we combine a bunch of monosaccharides and make them into a polysaccharide? Um, here you can see these are two glucoses. Two glucoses make a maltose. So if you've ever heard of sucrose, oh, you've probably seen sucrose in um, maybe foods that you've eaten before. There's high sucrose content. It's probably not the best food to eat. Um, so when you combine a glucose and a fructose, you get a sucrose. Now, how does that happen? There is a process called dehydration synthesis. So if we break that down, we hear the word dehydration. And when you're dehydrated, you're usually thirsty, right? In this case, you're creating a water. So you can kind of, a water molecule. Um, so you can kind of imagine like now the molecules are thirsty. So dehydration, right? They're losing um, some elements and then dehydration synthesis. Synthesis is creating a new molecule, right? So if you look at I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but if you look at the two glucoses, you can see there's an OH group, which is also called a hydroxyl group. Um, that's removed from one, and there is a hydrogen removed from the other, and that makes a water, because water is H2O. And then that is used to create a maltose. So dehydration synthesis is really important, especially when combining two molecules. Now we'll move on to number two, which is lipids. Lipids are always fun. Um, oh, I forgot to mention carbs and lipids have three elements in them, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So like CHO. Um, yes, so those are the three elements. There is nothing more in them. And that's why they're kind of really basic structures. So a lipid, you can see there are two main types um, in these diagrams. I'll explain it to you. There are saturated lipids and there are unsaturated lipids. Saturated is what we kind of see on the right where all of the, if you look at the little like diagonal um, zigzags, they're all kind of the same structure, right? But here in the on the left image, this is what we call unsaturated because you see this double bond. They can have multiple double bonds and that makes it kind of curve. You can see the structure, there's a cis double bond. And um, so the gray beads, if you would say, they're curving right? Because there's an extra bond. Um, and that changes the overall shape of the molecule, which changes the structure, which changes the function. Um, and in general, you know, like you have fat that's stored in your body. And that is usually energy reserve, right? If you're ever like super starved and you don't have any nutrition, um, your body will start using your fat reserves as a form of energy. Um, so that's what you can see here. And what's really interesting is how we can tie the structure and what the molecule looks like into how it functions. So here we see that saturated lipids are solid at room temperature. Unsaturated lipids are liquid at room temperature. And if we go back to the diagram, it kind of makes sense because if you look at the left image, this is an unsaturated lipid, right? And there is a bending. So lots of bending would lead to more fluidity and that is why I would say um, unsaturated lipids are fluid. And in comparison, you can see the saturated molecule probably stacks up really well and tightly, which is why it is a solid. 
And like I said before, saturated molecules have single bonds, unsaturated have at least one double bond. Um, and typically saturated fats are not healthy for you. So you can see the example is butter. Um, foods that taste really good or really sweet likely have saturated fats in them. Um, and we would consider olive oil a healthier oil and it is an unsaturated, or I guess any oil would be an unsaturated fat because they're liquid. Um, now we're going on to proteins, which is macromolecule number three. Proteins have four elements in them. So we talked about the original carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and now we have nitrogen. Um, nitrogen is used in the amine group of a protein. So if you, let's talk about the monomer first. The monomer of a protein is an amino acid, and you can combine amino acids to make polypeptides and proteins. So if you look at the top right diagram, let's see if I can, I don't know. Can, can you guys see my cursor? Can you type it in the chat if you can see my cursor? If not, I can annotate. Okay, perfect. All right, this top right image is an amino acid. And there are basically um, four, four, I guess five. We can say there are five main parts of an amino acid. There's what we call the alpha carbon. This is the alpha symbol. Um, what's up, Connor? You can unmute yourself. Or not. Um, okay. If you had a if you had a question, you can type it in the chat or in the Q and A. Oh, okay, no worries. Yes, this is biology. Um, right, so the center of an amino acid is, uh, we have a carbon and we call it the alpha carbon. It's in the center, it's holding the whole thing together. Then on the left side, we see an amine group, which is NH2. You can see there's one nitrogen and two hydrogens. Um, on the right side, there's a car carboxyl group, which is COOH. And on the top, we see a hydrogen. This is Excluding one amino acid, this is seen in every single amino acid in our body. Now, what makes every amino acid unique is this R side chain. Different amino acids have different side chains, and that causes them to have different properties and thus different functions. So you might know a bunch of amino acids are strung together to create a protein. But we also know that there are lots and lots of different proteins that have lots of different functions, right? So basically, the way that the amino acids are aligned and um, according to their properties, you'll have a certain function. So some R groups, our, our side chain, we call them R groups, um, will have a hydrophobic structure. So they are afraid of water. And other um, R groups will, have, will be hydrophilic, right? They'll be soluble in water. And so when you see a protein folding, it's very cool because the amino acids that are typically hydrophobic Phobic, so they're scared of water, will go on the interior of a protein. So I can kind of draw, <laughs> this is, pretend this is a protein, right? And we have amino acids that make up the whole thing. And we have some amino acids on the outside in red. But of course, this whole thing is just a chain of amino acids. We could say that the, the amino acids that are red are hydrophilic, right? Because they are on the outside, they're probably in an aqueous environment like our cytosol, and um, that's how they can survive there. And the hydrophobic sections of our protein will stay on the interior. Um, yes. Yeah, and the R group can also be charged, and um, that affects how it works with other amino acids. Charging is basically they're like positive or negative and they could attract or repel. And uh, yes, proteins are versus, oh, <laughs> my protein stayed, let's erase this. Um, proteins are versatile, they are so versatile, they're very cool. Um, literally any like function you can think of that your cells or body does, it likely is due to a protein. So um, you can ignore the examples for now because this, this, um, the class today is very basic in introduction, and it's going to pick up in intensity and difficulty as we progress through the weeks. Um, 
but you can just know an enzyme. If you don't know what an enzyme is, it's basically, it is a protein. And what it does is it allows a chemical reaction to occur faster than it normally would. And a lot of chemical reactions at like base level would take maybe years and years and years to fully occur. So we have enzymes that allow it to speed it up. And that way we can do different functions in our body. Um, like breaking things down, it's done by enzymes. And you definitely need to break down wastes in your cell. I would say that's a great example of how enzymes are used. Um, proteins are also used for storage. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, there's also hormones. Hormones are so, so important in your body. Um, basically everything for the most part that you do um, is related to a hormone for some, some sort. There's the growth hormone, which allows you to grow um, taller, there's insulin that's written here. If you don't have enough insulin, it's a problem. You guys have probably heard about diabetes. Um, insulin is an important hormone and hormones regulate literally everything from like how fast your heart is beating to your sleep cycle. There's all kinds of um, usages that we're gonna talk about in class five. One of our last classes will go over hormones. There are structural proteins. Um, Keratin is basically the protein that is in your nails, in your skin, in your hair, in your eyelashes. <laughs> they are um, a very important structural protein, like it says here, because it kind of holds your skin together. And your skin is obviously a very important physical barrier to the outside world. Um, it is cool to note, side note, that the cells in your skin and like your nails and hair are all dead which is like why when you, when you cut your hair, you don't really, it doesn't hurt, right? And for the most part, if you only scrape like the upper five-ish layers of skin, you wouldn't feel pain, um, but that is very like difficult to do. Usually if you're like hurting yourself, you go deeper and you go past all the, your layers of keratinocytes, which have keratin, and that's when you feel pain. There's also receptors, transportation, and defense. Um, Again, receptors are important because hormones are processed via receptors. Neurotransmitters are the molecules that go between your neurons. Um, and of course, you need your neurons in your brain to work because that is why we're here. So it's very interesting to see like how all the different protein types are all like so integral and so important in your body. Um, we move on to transportation. Hemoglobin is this like protein. It's in your red blood cells. There are four subunits and it's what holds oxygen. I don't think I need to explain why it's so important for us to have oxygen in our body. And then defense antibodies. Whenever you're sick with like a bacterial infection, your white blood cells will make antibodies and they will eat up bad guys. And that's why you are here today and you don't get too sick. So yeah, proteins are amazing. And lastly, we have nucleic acids. Uh, the elements are not written here, but it's chonp with a P. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Um, <coughs> nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, um, are, I, I'm not, I, I think you guys have a basic idea of DNA and RNA. DNA is used, you, you read your DNA to make proteins and thus everything in your body. So it's very important, you know, any missing chromosomes or missing nucle nucleotides can lead to detrimental effects. And RNA is used um, within your cell as well. I'm gonna go over this a little later today, but here we can kind of see, um, not really, there's no, okay. Basically a nucleotide has three basic parts right? You have your phosphate, you have your, um, phosphate is made, makes up this blue backbone. There's the phosphate, there is the actual nu nucleotide, which in our body or in DNA, you have adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Those are your nucleotides. And um, you can see here the adenine pairs with thymine, cytosine pairs with guanine. And in RNA, there is no thymine. So you have uracil instead and adenine will pair with uracil, cytosine will pair with guanine. Um, yes, next class, I will bring up a diagram and we can look at it more closely. Sorry, I do not have it right now. 
Um, and then there's purines and pyrimidines. Purines and pyrimidines I'll also include in our diagram, but it's basically like the number of rings in the molecule. You guys can look it up and look at a diagram. If you just Google like nucleotides diagram, you'll be able to see the difference. Um, yes, that is all. And so here we see on the right side how the nucleotides are pairing, right? And the bonds between these two that holds it together are hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are one of the most like fundamental and basic bonds in our body. And you don't really need to know how they work. Just it's important to know that there are hydrogen bonds that hold together our DNA. Um, yeah, and then DNA versus RNA. This is like great general knowledge for you to know. I, oh, I didn't mention. So for the most part, RNA is single stranded. So here we see there's like two rings that make up a backbone and there are two of them, right? So you can imagine like say this blue line was not here then you would have an, and you, you replace the nucleotides, you would have an RNA. It's single-stranded. Um, DNA is only held in your nucleus. So your chromosomes are made of DNA. They stay in your nucleus, right? And um, again, I will go over this a little later today, but RNA is kind of used all over your cell. When you are converting a RNA strand into a protein, you have to use something called messenger RNA. Then you also have to use tRNA and rRNA, and there are lots and lots of different types that are used in different places of the cell. R oh yeah, it says it at the bottom. rRNA is ribosomal RNA, and that's what makes up your ribosomes. Um, and ribos <coughs> sorry, ribosomes are what make up are what make our proteins. And again, next class I will include a diagram, and we can look at look at why DNA is called deoxy versus just RNA, which is ribonucleic acid, right? Um, there is basically deoxy, you're lacking one oxygen um, in DNA as compared, uh, compared to RNA. Now we'll move on to the cell. The cell is really fun, really cool. Um, I like this diagram a lot. I think it says, holds like all of the important stuff. So here we see the nucleus at the center, right? It's in purple. The nucleus holds, like I said, our, chromo our chromosomes, but you can also see this like darker purple spot and that is our nucleolus. So within your nucleus, you have the nucleolus. Oh, it says it up here too, nucleolus. And that is where your ribosomes are made. So I talked earlier about rRNA. So basically, you have your rRNA here, then you have proteins in your cytoplasm that are like transported into the nucleus, into the nucleolus. Although there's no physical boundary, it's just a separate region. And that's where you assemble your ribosomes. Then your ribosomes work in the cytoplasm. So then they'll leave, come out here. Um, not sure, yeah, ribosomes. So they're out here and then they'll do their function, which is creating proteins. Um, oh, it's also, very important to know that the nucleus has a double membrane. So instead of one layer surrounding it, there are two layers. And um, yeah, it's very good because you want to protect your DNA. You don't want anything to get in that's not supposed to be there. And there are some holes. So you can kind of see these like ugly <laughs> circular rings here. And those are holes because you do need some things coming in, right? And these are regulated. So if you need proteins to make your ribosomes, you'll import them here. Um, so on and so forth. If you want your DNA or your RNA to leave the cytoplasm, that's how they'll leave. So let me explain to you a little bit about transcription, which we'll go over more in the next um, class. So here we'll say this is a DNA molecule and you have your, oh no, okay. DNA, lots of DNA, and then this is an adenine, this is a thymine, this is guanine, this is cytosine, so on and so forth. Now, when you're wanting to create a protein, you have to first unzip this DNA, right? So you're basically just gonna cut a hole across this section, and now you're gonna have two, red's kind of an ugly color, <laughs> let's use blue. Now you'll have two separate strands. So you'll have this here, and again, all these like small lines are nucleotides. So now these are separated and that's done by an enzyme that is called helicase, all right? 
Helicase, uh, we like to say it unzips your DNA. It's kind of like a zipper, right? So you're unzipping it. And let's erase this. So now we have our separated DNA. And we actually don't need both strands to eventually become a protein. We're going to only need one. So let's say we are just looking at the top strand for now. That's your DNA in blue, right? Then you'll have, um, you'll have to convert your DNA into RNA because the problem is proteins cannot read DNA. They're just, oh, sorry, ribosomes cannot read DNA. Um, they're unable to do that. And ribosomes are what make our proteins. So what we do is we convert our DNA to something that's called mRNA. Ooh, I'm on a eraser. Um, all right. We'll convert our DNA to mRNA. Um, M standing for messenger, and it makes sense, right? It is the middle point between DNA and protein. It's our messenger RNA. So essentially what we'll do is we'll get an enzyme. Enzyme, see we're using our proteins. And so say this was an adenine. That's such an ugly adenine. <laughs> Sorry guys. All right, this is an adenine. This is an adenine. Then does anyone remember what RNA molecule pairs with adenine? So we see thymine in DNA. Right now we're converting our DNA to RNA. Perfect, yeah, it's uracil. So here we'll have an A and a U. Then say this was G, this is C, sorry for the poor handwriting guys, and so on and so forth. And now you have your mRNA molecule, right? So now let's erase our DNA because we are done with it. And this mRNA molecule will leave the nucleus, so it'll go out and come into the cytoplasm. And wow, that's such an ugly <laughs> mRNA. So I'll redraw it. So now you have your ribosome who is ready to essentially turn your mRNA into protein. So if we look at this diagram, oh no, eraser, all right. Sorry guys. <laughs> all right, this is a lovely, lovely ribosome. And a ribosome is made of two subunits. Um, this arrow is convenient. <laughs> you have this larger subunit and the smaller subunit, which is here. And um, these are separate, but basically what happens is you have, it's labeled mRNA here. You have your mRNA like travel through between these subunits and um, you're, okay, backtrack. So within your mRNA, you have different codons and codons will tell you what amino acid you need. So there is a codon that is adenine, uracil, and guanine. And this will code for an amino acid called methionine. Um, and like that, there are, I think, 64 different codons that are possible. You can Google a codon chart and it'll tell you um, all the different amino acid combinations, amino acid, nucleic acid combinations, along with the amino acid that they make. And three of them, uh, create stop codons, which I'll go over in a little bit. So the first, um, the first codon a ribosome will read is the AUG codon. So it'll keep on searching, and you can you can imagine like mRNA is very very long, right? So it'll search across the whole thing until it reaches an AUG. Um, of course, you could imagine there are going to be multiple AUGs, um, but the ribosome also will look for something, this is very deep, it is called Kozak's rule. Um, I'll go over it in the next few classes, but basically you can just for now understand that your ribosome is looking for an AUG. And it's searching and it's searching, and let's say that this red one here is AUG. Then um, we said that AUG codes for the amino acid methionine. So here's the, it gets a little tricky and complicated, but it is all really interesting um, to see it fold together. So now you have a separate structure called tRNA, which is transfer RNA. And basically what it does is you can see here, it's carrying an amino acid. So we can pretend that this, um, this is methionine, or yeah, this is methionine. Let's say that orange is methionine. 
So what will happen is the um, this is the last class of today. The next class will be tomorrow. So you have your tRNA, which is carrying your amino acid, right? And here, what will happen is it'll have the opposite of your codon. So the opposite of AUG, A matches with U, U matches with A, G matches with C, right? So here it'll say U, A, C, right? And now your UAC will come all the way here and it'll connect, right? Because they are matching in nucleotides. And essentially what will happen is the process that you see in the center of this in blue um, is how the amino acids will connect. So after a while, after going through all these codons, first you had methionine come, then we can say we had arginine, then cysteine. And we kind of build a bridge. So you have your tRNA enter, it'll slide over, the amino acids will connect and it'll continuously, you will see the ribosome that will move in this direction along the mRNA. And that's how proteins are made. If that was too confusing or too much, I will also go over this in more depth the next class. So that's always good. And um, I think there are some nice like YouTube videos that I can search for and send to you guys as well that show the process of protein synthesis. And something else that's interesting, so we call this the central dogma of biology. Does anyone know what the central dogma is? Okay, that's okay. So the central dogma is basically, you have your, it's what I just showed you. It's DNA becomes RNA. And what does RNA turn into? Absolutely, RNA will turn into protein. And so this is what we call the central dogma of, D of biology because it's what makes up life, right? You have your DNA and the end goal is to have proteins and your proteins do everything for you. So the process from DNA to RNA is called transcription. And the process from RNA to protein is called translation. Translation. <laughs> um, and those are two very important processes that happen in your body. So I will erase this and we can go back to the cell diagram. Look at the different organelles and what their functions are. So now that we're on this slide, we might as well look at it. Ribosomes, like I said, they do protein synthesis and you see more in cells that create more proteins. So the pancreas is really important because it creates hormones, it creates enzymes, and um, those are all proteins like we went over earlier. So you see more ribosomes in cells, or also in the liver, in cells that make more proteins. And there are free ribosomes and bound ribosomes Free ribosomes are kind of like emptily hanging in the cytosol. They can move around wherever. And bound ribosomes are, that didn't work. Bound ribosomes, you can see the dots in the, on the blue structure. They're attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And this kind of helps because when proteins are synthesized here, if they need to be transported into the nucleus, they'll just be created enter the ER and enter the nucleus. It's kind of like a maze. Um, and that's proteins. And then I went over earlier about the nucleus. Nucleus has your chromosomes, double membrane. Yeah, perfect. And this is a nice simplified diagram. Okay. Next, we'll continue going over the organelles. Okay. So, where should we start? Oh, flagellum, you see it on the top here. Flagellum is basically, you see this not in every cell. Um, it is kind of like 
optional <laughs> depending on how the cell works. So sperm cells do have flagella because they kind of like swim, I guess, and that helps with motility. But um, I would say the average cell in your body does not have a flagella. Um, there's also, this is an animal cell, but in most fungi and plants, there is something called a cell wall. And it's like, it's outside of the cell membrane and it's very strong and hardy and it allows the cell to survive in an environment that's not the greatest. <laughs> um, yeah, so there is that cell wall. We went over the nucleolus. Um, so also the cytoplasm, you, you might, you may probably know this. It is like a jelly like fluid. It's clear. It holds all your nutrients, holds all your organelles. And it's, um, it's actually very structured. You'll have like railways kind of like you see this yellow here, um, across the whole cytoplasm. And that's like holding everything in place. You kind of, I, for the most part, I remember I imagined a cell as like you have things floating around everywhere doing whatever they want, but it is a lot more structured than that. And things are kind of held in place, which is good. <laughs> and then the endoplasmic reticulum, I kind of went over it. I went over the ribosomes on it, but basically it is here. You see the ER, rough ER has ribosomes, smooth ER doesn't. Um, they actually have slightly different functions. Um, this, there's like detoxification, lipid synthesis, and transportation. You can see there's a lot of sacs and membrane synthesis. So our cell membrane obviously breaks down, right? It wears and tears over time. So there are points where we need to rebuild it. And how do we do that? Basically, we'll have our messages that are sent to the um, nucleus and they're like, hey, we need help, right? We need we need um, to fix this hole, or maybe there's lots of transportation happening and they wanna close up a gap. So your DNA will make protein and then essentially the rough ER will play a large role in this and they will help with lipid synthesis and protein synthesis and it'll be transported through these sacs, through the cytoplasm in vacuoles. And this is not a vacuole, but in um, like a sac, and that'll be taken to the cell membrane. And um, yeah, that's how you fix, <laughs> you fix your cell membrane if it is broken, if it needs repairing. And then we move on to the mitochondria. <laughs> you guys probably know that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Super important does um, energy, right? It converts our glucose molecules into ATP and ATP is adenosine triphosphate. It's used in anything that requires energy in our body. Um, yeah, we can go over um, glycolysis and cellular respiration. I was hesitant to include it today because I wasn't sure what level most people here are. So if you would like to learn about cellular respiration and glycolysis, could you please message that to me or add it to the Q&A, wherever you want to, um, just so I know whether I should include it next week. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> glycolysis, cellular respiration, it's not the most fun topics, but I would say there are very interesting. Um, yeah, perfect. Okay, I will go in depth into this next class then. Yeah, could try. That's a great response, actually. Um, it is. It is confusing. I would say I had to read it maybe like two, three times until I was like solid with how it works. And um, What's good about glycolysis is you don't really need to memorize every single intermediate and every molecule because that's a very tedious task. Um, but what I would ask is before the next class, I would like everyone to watch maybe one YouTube video about glycolysis, something simple like a two minute video, just saying the overview because it is a lot to comprehend, especially the first time. Um, and I don't want anyone to be too, too lost. Okay, then um, let me dismiss these. Okay, there we 
we go. Um, right, next we have the vacuole. Is a vacuole labeled here? It is not. Okay, vacuoles basically do storage in our cells. They store anything that needs to be shipped out, um, anything that's used, it, vacuoles are storage. And what's cool is in plant cells, there is a large central vacuole. It is in the smack, I wouldn't say center of the cell, but pretty much center of the cell near the nucleus. And um, if you've ever seen a plant start wilting, you know, when they kind of like droop down and they're dying, it's because they likely don't have enough water. And the vacuole in plants, especially the central vacuole helps with water storage. So the more water, the more like expanded the cells are, the more sturdy of a plant it is. And if it doesn't have water, the cells will droop. And that's why you get a wilted flower. So it's always, um, I'd like to ask of anyone who ever has interest in biology, try to see this like around you. Maybe next time you get scraped or hurt, you're like, hey, you know, I see that my proteins are gone, but now I have platelets that are working and they're creating new cells. And that's why I have a scab, or maybe you lost a lot of blood and now you know erythropoietin is being made and that means more red blood cells from your bone marrow, and that means you're good to go. Um, and again, we'll learn more about all of this and across all the classes, but that's like the final goal, to be able to apply biology to almost like anything around you. And that's what makes it a really fun concept, I would say, as opposed to like chemistry or phys, I guess physics, you can also see a lot of, but um, you know, it's very difficult to see the molecular structure of something around you. Maybe I have some type of bias but um, it's always great to see biology in the world around you. <laughs> I also didn't plan on going over photosynthesis. This was gonna be more like animal biology um, or like humans for the most part. Um, but when I touch on cellular respiration, I will also maybe slightly go over photosynthesis if we have time because it's cool to see that in plants as well. So similar to the flagella, we have cilia. Is there cilia in this? Oh man, my diagram is failing me, you guys. <laughs> cilia is essentially, you can, you see how there's microvilli here? Those are basically like cilia. Um, they're projections from the cell and they help move, they help gather molecules in your small intestine. Small intestine is where the majority of um, absorption happens. So you're absorbing your amino acids, your sugars, your lipids, everything really that you're absorbing happens in the small intestine. So you can imagine like the cells in your small intestine are absorbing a lot because we eat it. Like <laughs> I've seen some people eat a good amount of food and that is um, a lot to be digested, right? So in, in cells in your small intestine, you would kind of see like, so this is like the lining of your small intestine. So like that, you have your cells. Oh gosh, I'm gonna work on my like <laughs> Zoom drawing before next class. Okay, let's pretend you just have some really abnormally wide cells like this. Um, boom, boom, boom. There we go. Now we have your cells, and these you can imagine like goes on, goes on, and all of these cells have a lot called villi, villi, villi here. And these are like outward projections and they help, something's happening. <laughs> they help absorb nutrients, um, which is always great. So that's the villi we see here. Celia is the same, same on the outside. It helps the cells move. And there are like curtains in front of me and they're opening. <laughs> It's interesting. So that's that's the fun part um, or interesting thing about villi, microvilli. Um, yes. Then you have, let's see, what else is on this diagram? Oh, right. Peroxisomes. I think if there is any organelle you do not know, it's likely a peroxisome. And these basically, um, anything I would say like wasteful or toxic in your cell that's like you should really get rid of is done by the peroxisome. And it makes hydrogen peroxide as a byproduct, which is like really bad. <laughs> you don't want hydrogen peroxide in your cell. So what happens is after hydrogen peroxide 
is um, made as a byproduct of chopping things up, um, it is later converted to water. So H2O2 becomes H2O, which is great because water is, water is fine. <laughs> Hydrogen peroxide is definitely not fine. Um, let's see what else. There is the Golgi, which is making anything. It's like pretty cool organelle, very versatile. Um, it, like it says here, synthesis, modification, sorting, secretion, um, basically anything that you don't see in the other organelles, the Golgi takes care of it. I like to remember it like that. Um, yes. Um, I don't think, so we're going to go over um, cell division, likely, um, if we have time. Cellular respiration and cell division are both like very big topics and I wouldn't like to drag them further than the second class. So I'll look at that and see which one I think is of greater importance. But if we do go over, we should go over cell division and there we'll talk more about the centrosome and chromosomes and how things divide, what it creates, why it's needed. Yes, so that is that. And I think that's all. That's all I had for this. Um, so now it is time for questions. We have about 12 minutes to ask any questions. Hang on, my thing is not showing up. You can also talk about things that you wanna learn about in the next class because I would say this is a very like open class, whatever you want to learn about, I will teach you. Yeah, so mRNA is used in COVID vaccines. Um, typically a vaccine. Also, um, whoever was talking about disc and washers, isn't that like calculus? I, I could be thinking of the wrong thing, but um, not too sure. Right, so this is biology class and we will not be going over calculus. <laughs> Um, so a typical vaccine is composed of injecting a weakened thing into your body. So you can imagine, let's see, tetanus, right? Tetanus is a very horrible disease. Um, don't touch rusty nails. <laughs> they typically have Clostridium tetany, I think is the bacteria. And basically what it does is it leads to muscle paralysis everywhere and you will die. <laughs> you cannot breathe, your heart will not pump, you can't move your muscles, it is bad. But the tetanus, you should all have tetanus vaccines. <laughs> and basically what they do is they inject a really weakened or dead clostridium tetany into your body and your white blood cells will fight it. And they're able to typically fight a weakened, um, weakened bacteria, right? because it's not as strong as it could be. And your white blood cells and antibodies have memory. So once it fights something, the next time it comes again, it's like, oh, I remember you. And it's able to destroy it faster. And that's the whole goal is like, you don't wanna be fighting it the first time in a like life-threatening situation. So you don't wanna get tetanus or like, you know, scratch your finger on a rusty nail and suddenly you have this horrible bacteria in your body and you're fighting it for the first time. Um, and that's the point of a vaccine. So the next time you get it, you're able to fight it a lot faster and a lot harder. I can send these slides afterwards. Um, so I think this video will be posted on the website. And if not, I will speak to people as to how I can email you guys this. Um, yeah, I'll do my best.